Welcome to RICO 12. My name is Justin, and I am a child of an all-powerful and all-loving God and a recovering addict, and am blessed to be the host of this meeting and podcast. RICO 12 is an organization with the mission of learning and sharing the similarities of addiction of all kinds and gaining and sharing tools and hope from others who are walking a similar path. We come together from all places, faiths, and backgrounds to gain tools and hope from others who are walking this same path as us. Speakers from past meetings have represented so many fellowships, addictions, and afflictions, and we look forward to continuing to add to the diversity of speakers and backgrounds. I'm excited about today's speaker, ENS, who was originally slated to speak to us in the end of March, but due to the illness of our scheduled speaker today has generously been willing and able to move his commitment to today. Thanks again, Ian. That's awesome. Now, before we get to Ian, just a little more housekeeping and announcements about uh, an upcoming RICO 12 project. Launching on March 1st of 2023, we will open a new share meeting called RICO 12 Shares. All are welcome to record a solution-based share that will be uploaded into short 20-minute recorded recovery meetings available in podcast format anytime, anywhere. To learn more and to possibly record a share or prayer of your own, please visit www.rico12.com forward slash shares or click on the links that will be in the show notes and the chat of the live live meeting. RICO 12 is a self-supporting service, and we appreciate your help in, in, uh, in helping us uh, move this, this uh, program forward. And as you can see, I just did some fancy pants stuff there and sharing uh, my screen for, with a QR code that you can uh, use if you choose here. Um, if you choose to donate and become a spearhead to help us spearhead these projects and, and help, uh, go ahead and do so either by snapping a picture of that QR code or clicking the links that'll be in the show notes or in the live meeting here. We look forward each week to hearing uh, and receiving from the light reflected from our speakers. That light inspires hope, meaning, worth, and growth in us, the listening audience. Now let's introduce our guest speaker for today, another RICO 12 first-time speaker, Ian S. Now here's a little bit about Ian. Ian is a recovered alcoholic of the sort described in the in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. He has an abnormal reaction to alcohol, but much more troublesome is the way he reacts to the absence of alcohol. Ian started drinking when he was a teenage boy, but it was in his thirties that he discovered his utter inability to leave it alone, no matter how great the necessity or wish. And that's from page 34 of the big book. This lack of power was not curable by any human power, neither expensive rehabilitation centers, nor the love he has for his beautiful four-year-old son nor any other method he tried could free him from the insidious insanity of that first drink. But then Ian had a profound spiritual experience, midwifed by a man who had suffered the same difficulty and found the same solution. The 12-step program of of spiritual action outlined in the same book that described his trouble exactly. Over the course of 10 days, his sponsor took him through all 12 steps, and he experienced complete recovery from that seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. He has not had a drink since. Take it away, Ian. The floor is yours. Wow. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for that great introduction. And thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, As Justin told you, my name is Ian, and I am a recovered alcoholic. And the topic I want to talk with you guys about today uh, is the 10th step of our program of action and the promises that we are assured will occur if we take that 10th step. But to make that make sense, let me start by explaining a little bit what I mean when I say that I'm a recovered alcoholic, right? How do I know that I'm an alcoholic or an addict of any variety? How do you know that you are? And how do we know if we have recovered or not, right? Because Mere chemical sobriety or mere freedom from, you know, bottom line acting out behaviors, things like that. I think we all have an intuitive sense that we're looking for a little bit more in recovery uh, than just chemical sobriety, right? As Justin said, my main problem when I was untreated uh, actually happened when I was completely chemically sober. I felt restless. I felt irritable. I felt discontented. I felt bored, depressed, anxious. I couldn't live like that. And over any considerable period of time, for that reason, uh, I would enter a curious mental blank spot that would always lead me back 
to the first drink and the attendant wreckage that that would create in my life. So I know that I'm looking for something more than just chemical sobriety because chemical sobriety for me was a miserable experience, right? I mean, drinking got pretty miserable too, but I was in that sad position that the book describes in a vision for you where I could no longer imagine life with alcohol and I could no longer imagine life without it. I had reached the jumping off point. So what does it mean to be a recovered alcoholic, right? And I remember when I was coming in uh, to this fellowship. Uh, and when I was uh, the, meeting my sponsor, the one that Justin described, uh, who took me through the uh, steps, uh, I ran into a fellow who recommended to me that I read the text from uh, pages 84 to 85 of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that describes the 10th step promises. And that's actually where I want to begin is just reading this to you. Because she said to me, that's the description of a recovered alcoholic or of, a, or of a recovered addict, right? This is what recovery looks like. It's not just chemical sobriety. Here's what it says. This is from pages 84 and 85. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol or drugs or you know, acting out behaviors. For by this time, sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally. And we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We're not fighting it. Neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we had been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We are neither cocky, nor are we afraid. That is our experience. That is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. And boy, I have a lot to say about those promises. The first of which is, you know, I probably read this paragraph many times before this fellow that I'm talking about uh, directed me to it, but it never hit me the way that it hit me when I read it that time. I almost started crying in frustration because it seems to me that this paragraph was obviously impossible. This was obviously impossible for me. The idea that I would not be interested in liquor and that if I were tempted, I would recoil from it as from a hot flame seems to me like a completely unfair thing to dangle in front of a person who was an alcoholic and dying of untreated alcoholism, right? I thought that chemical sobriety, kind of gutting it out one day at a time. Have you ever heard that? One day at a time, just one day at a time. I thought that that kind of life of hanging on by my fingernails, hour by hour, sometimes one hour at a time, if that's what it takes. I thought that that was the best I'd be able to, uh, ever able to be uh, achieved. And I thought that my main problem was that I wasn't trying hard enough to achieve that. And here comes this person who tells me that essentially, if I follow this program of action, but some more by the time I get to the 10th step, I'm going to have a new attitude about liquor that is going to be given to me. And here's the amount of thought or effort on my part it's going to take. None. Zero. The only effort that's going to be required, I'm told, is the effort necessary to follow a few simple instructions. Um, And the idea that this could actually be literally true blew my mind because I realized by that point, at this point in my life, I had stopped drinking. I don't even know how many times. Stopping drinking is easy. I've done it hundreds of times. It's staying stopped. That's the problem, right? And I knew that if I could not enter a state where I was just not interested in alcohol, that I had no chance of survival. I knew that advice like just don't drink uh, and go to the next meeting and don't drink between meetings. Have you ever heard that advice? I tried that. I tried that for years, actually, and it just didn't work for me. I knew advice like put the plug in the jug. Don't drink today, no matter what. I knew I couldn't do that because I had been trying to do that for years, and the results were incredibly unimpressive, incredibly unimpressive. I knew that advice like well, call me before you pick up the first drink. I knew that that didn't work for me because I didn't find myself able to do it, right? I'd have people who cared about me in the fellowship. I'd had sponsors before. I'd had all sorts of people that I could call if I were thinking about drinking. And you know what? I never did. I never did. Because by the time I entered that curious mental blank spot where for one reason or another, I thought that I could avoid the you know, suffering and humiliation of a week or a month or a day ago, uh, or, or I wasn't thinking about it at all. For whatever reason, whatever form of insanity 
I was gripped by was also sufficient to stop me from picking up the phone and talking to somebody about it. Because if I were going to do that, I've got an even easier idea. Instead of calling before you pick up the next drink, here's an even simpler piece of advice. Just don't pick up the next drink, right? Just don't drink no matter what. Those things didn't work for me. None of that worked for me. I found myself led back over and over and over, just like in the chapter more about alcoholism describes, uh, to that first insidious insanity of the first drink that would begin this spree. I'd think to myself things like, I know I don't have a good ability to control the amount that I take, so I've got to keep it just to tonight, right? I had that thought, which is an insane thought because that's the whole thing I can't do. But I'd have that thought. I'd start drinking and I'd be off to the races. And I knew when I read this, when this fellow directed me to these promises, that this was my only chance, my only hope for survival. Because by this point in my life, it had become a matter of life and death. I was uh, so far advanced in this malady that I was not able to stay sober for more than two or three days on my own power by the end. And that took a, a lot of effort. The intervals of sanity were getting shorter and shorter, rarer and rarer. And the overwhelming compulsion to pick up that first drink was getting stronger and stronger and stronger. I could, it's like I could see the gates of insanity and death kind of closing on me. And there was just this little sliver of light uh, still open between them. And so I knew that this, this could save me, right? If I could get to a state where uh, I would react to the idea of drinking alcohol, as the book says, sanely and normally, and what does that mean for me? It means don't do it because I have an abnormal physical reaction to alcohol. So the sane and normal reaction is just to not drink at all, right? If, if that were my only problem, I'd be like a person with an allergy to strawberries, right? I just don't eat the strawberries. Uh, but I found that I couldn't do that. But if I could react sanely and normally, and if it could happen automatically, automatically, and that I wouldn't have to think myself into this. Right. Because I knew I couldn't do that. I knew that my memory strategies, right, play the tape all the way through, all the way through. Think, 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 you know, remember the last time. Now, that ever worked for me either. But if this could just sort of happen, if my mind could just kind of be rewired somehow um, where I wouldn't have to fight it or avoid temptation, if I could achieve what it describes as neutrality, then I could be safe. Then I could be protected. Because then I wouldn't be in danger of sprees. I wouldn't be in danger of drinking. I wouldn't be in danger of any of this stuff. Uh, and I wouldn't have to swear off, which is a good thing, because everybody in my life is pretty tired of hearing me swear off by that point, right? How many times had I sworn off before? How many times had I meant it before? The answer is a lot and a lot. I'd really sworn off and really meant it many, many times before. Uh, but I wouldn't have to do that. Instead, I was going to have this problem removed, removed. By whom? Well, by God, of course. Um, this was what was promised to me when I came into the program, right? That the level of effort required, uh, that the level of willpower required, that the level of, you know, thinking and trying uh, was going to completely change, that this was essentially going to become actually pretty easy. As long, it says, as I were to keep in fit spiritual condition. Right. Now, there's a reason that these are the 10th step promises, because they're not something we can expect to achieve until we've vigorously worked the whole program of action up until that point. And I'm going to talk about the instructions for step 10 and how it uh, indicates that we're to do that in just a minute. But I really think, you know, I'm not a one to suggest edits the first pages of the of the big book, the first 164. But I've heard people say in the past, you know, this should be like printed on the cover. Right. Because this is the whole paycheck of the program for me. The 10th step promises are what it makes it possible for me to stay alive. Right. All of the other promises in this book are great. But when we read things like the ninth step promises, when we talk about losing uh, fear of people and of economic insecurity, knowing how to handle situations intuitively, which used to baffle us, those things are great. Those have happened in my life. Uh, but I wasn't dying of not intuitively knowing how to handle situations that used to baffle me, at least not directly. I wasn't dying of fear of people, although, as we'll see, I kind of was. I was dying of untreated alcoholism and the inability to stop drinking no matter how great the desire. And this paragraph tells me that this program can solve that problem completely, right? Completely. And how do I do it? How do I do it? 
Let's take a look then at the other thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, We know what's possible, right? And I'll tell you that this has come true in my life completely. I have complete neutrality today with respect to alcohol. Um, My girlfriend is an ordinary, moderate, temperate drinker. She has, you know, about two drinks a month. Uh, She'll have a nice glass of wine with dinner or something. But what that means is that um, we're we have alcohol in the house sometimes, right? We'll have a you know bottle of wine in the house sometimes, left over from when she might have had something for a nice dinner, like it was just Valentine's Day. And it holds absolutely no interest to me, none whatsoever. It doesn't tempt me. I don't have to keep it out of my house. It, it's it's like rat poison to me. If I drink that, I'll die. And so I don't have to swear off and I don't have to avoid drinking it. I find it a complete position of neutrality to be exactly what describes my life. I worked um, you know, uh, a few months ago in an uh, office, a sort of co-working space. They, uh, because they were very modern and hip, they had uh, beer in the you know communal uh, refrigerators there in the office, right? This didn't pose a problem for me whatsoever. None whatsoever. Now, I was there. I was unmonitored. Nobody would have raised an eyebrow if I'd started drinking that beer. And it had no interest for me whatsoever. And that could not be more different than my experience before I worked this program of action. To say the least, that's an understatement. That's an incredible understatement, right? I was a real alcoholic who, as I said, could not stay sober for more than two or three days. I was getting alcoholic necropathy, which is when your nerve endings uh, sort of start to uh, die and your fingertips and stuff go numb. In my 30s, I was bad. I got the DTs trying to withdraw from alcohol on my own without medical supervision. Well, here, pro tip for you, don't try to do that. Go see a doctor if you're that far along. Uh, I was bad. And the idea that I'd ever be in a position where I'd be at work and I could just have a free beer if I wanted to and have no interest, no interest, it it sounds like it should be impossible, right? But I tell you that, I tell you truly, that is my experience. And if it were not my experience, I could not live. There'd be no way I could live. If I am fighting temptation on a day-to-day basis, then eventually, it's like that old um, Sinn Féin saying, you know, uh, we have to be the other guys have to be lucky every single day. We only have to be lucky once. My disease doesn't have to win the argument about whether or not I should drink every day. It only has to win that argument like one day out of, I don't know, 100. My sprees can last a long time. So if I'm in a constant chess match against my against temptation, um, even if I win 99 percent of the time, That means there are going to be three or four days a year when I start off on sprees and uh, my sprees do not last like a few hours. So that's no way to live. I couldn't do that. I need my attention level to be at zero. And that's what's happened for me. So how did that happen? How did that happen? What did I do? Right. Because that was the question that I had when uh, this fellow directed me to this and I read it and I actually understood it. And I was moved almost to tears because it felt unfair to promise. The next question in my mind right? Just like it suggests it'll be uh, with a prospect in the chapter working with others was, okay, what do I have to do, right? If you're telling me that this is possible, and I guess I kind of believe you, what do I have to do? And that takes us to the 10th step instructions. This is on page 84. This says, this thought brings us to step 10. And we've all heard step 10 described, right? We've heard it read at the beginning of meetings many times, suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. The 10th step instructions are only a paragraph, but if you notice something as we go through them, I think you will find that what the 10th step uh, instructions are, are do the whole program of action, basically three through nine, every day for the rest of your life, and you will experience this neutrality with respect to uh, alcohol or other addictions. So let's just go through this paragraph and you can see for yourself because there's a lot of power here. Right. So it says we vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. That means we don't wait until all of our step nine amends are done, because those may take quite some time in some cases to start living in the world of the spirit. Well, because, well, why would we wait? Right. Uh, We've entered the world of the spirit, it says. And our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. And note well that language, grow in understanding and effectiveness. I sometimes hear step 10 referred to as a maintenance step. And it's true enough that we are trying to maintain a recovered state and maintain a sort of level of, uh, you know, a certain spiritual condition. But actually, this is a growth step. It says so right here. Our next function is not to just stay the same but to grow in understanding and effectiveness. And we see the same thing in step 11, by the way, when we continue to increase our conscious contact with God and grow in that relationship too. This is not an overnight matter, it says. In other words, this is not a step you work one time. It should continue, book says, for our lifetime. 
In other words, we're going to have to have a 10th step practice for the rest of our lives, as long as we'd like to stay recovered anyway. And once we experience the promises of recovery, if you're anything like me, you're going to want very badly to hold on to what you have found. And so if, we're go- if we want to do that, we're going to have to continue to work step 10 for the rest of our lives. And how do we do it? How do we do it? It says continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Now, that should sound familiar. That should sound very familiar because those are the very things that we took inventory of when we worked our fourth step. When we did our thorough and searching moral inventory, this is exactly what we were looking for in ourselves, selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, fear. What the 10th step is telling us to do is to continue that process of inventory. And when we spot them, we have a spiritual tool, the moral inventory, the way it is directed to us in uh, how it works when we get the instructions for the moral inventory. When we spot these things, selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, fear, those manifestations of self, I think what we're supposed to do is get out some paper, get out a pen, draw some columns, and work the instructions just like we did in step four the first time, right? I think that's what we're supposed to do. The book goes on. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. What does that sound like? That sounds to me like steps six and seven, where I become entirely willing or entirely ready to have God remove my defects of character, and then I humbly ask him to do so, right? Because the purpose of the moral inventory is to spot those, uh, you know, root causes that, you know, character defects that are keeping me from an effective two-way relationship with the one who has all the power, lack of power being my dilemma after all. So I'm going to take that after I identify those character defects when I take moral inventory in step 10, and I'm going to take them to God and say, hey, can you remove these from me? And can you strengthen the contrary virtues, right? That's what I think step 10 is telling us to do. Then it says, and this one's a big one, folks, we discuss them with someone immediately. And I'm going to stop right there because there's a second part of that sentence. But this, for me, is the part of the 10th step that I think gets the least love and so needs a little more love uh, in this moment. The 10th step says that we're supposed to take inventory like we learned to do in step four. What number, for all the marbles in today's uh, recovery podcast, for all the marbles, what number comes after four? That's right. If you said five, you know, write in for your free Starbucks gift card because we are supposed to share moral inventory when we take it. When I have a resentment, when I'm afraid of something and I write it down, I might think to myself, well, I've done well enough to admit this to myself, a solitary self appraisal, right? But we learn in step five that that's usually insufficient, that it's usually insufficient. And time and again, we have seen alcoholics and other addicts take stock, but not be willing to share what they found with anybody else. And having persevered with so much of the rest of the program, they wonder why they stumble and get drunk or use or act out again. What step 10 says is, no, 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 we discuss them. That is selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear with someone immediately, which means we need to be sharing our 10 step inventories. And that can be with a sponsor. That can be with another recovered person that we know and who's, uh, who understands what it is that we're doing. In fact, if you look at the step five instructions, it can be with any person who is going to be unaffected and can keep a confidence, right? So uh, maybe you share it with uh, you know a priest in the confessional. Maybe you share it with a closed mouth and understanding friend, as long as they're going to be unaffected by the situation. Step five has all sorts of good instructions on how to choose a person who's to hear inventory. But the point is we do have to choose a person and we do have to share it with them immediately. There's a lot of power in that, a lot of power in that. The second part of that sentence is, and make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone. Quickly. You got to do it quickly. And what's that a reference to? Well, that's eight and nine, obviously, right? Where we make amends and we clean up the past because we've decided to be agents of God's uh, ever advancing creation. And we're going to make up for them and we're going to try to clean up the mistakes that we make as soon as we identify them. So when we spot little weeds growing up in our spiritual garden, when we realize, hey, I've been selfish, I've been dishonest, I've been, you know, resentful or fearful. And because I of the character defects that led me into those states, I actually caused harm to another person. I need to clean that up quickly. A weed is easy to pull when it's a little weed. 
But if we let it go, if we let it sit, it may become much harder and we may be facing a process of much more daunting uh, amends like we did probably when we took our step nine amends uh, through the first time. There were a lot of weeds in my life that I'd let grow for a long time, a lot of mistakes that I had let sit uncorrected for a very long time. And it could be it could be a little daunting to correct mistakes uh, that have grown up to that magnitude. So that's why step 10 says, no, no, when you make a mistake and you hurt somebody else, we make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone. So that's steps eight and nine. So then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help, right? What does that sound like? Well, that should sound like, first of all, step 12, right? Where we carry the message of recovery, the thing that has freed us from the bondage of self, we carry it to the people who are dying of the very same things we were dying of. Uh, but also we know that uh, an effective demonstration of these principles lies before us in our homes, in our businesses, in our respective affairs. So this is certainly a reference to step 12. And it's also a reference toward practicing these principles in all parts of our lives, right? So maybe we don't have a sponsor we're working with right at this second. Although if we don't, we ought to be getting on that. But we can always think about someone else we can help. If I'm sitting around experiencing fear and I follow this process, if I follow this process and I'm sitting around feeling afraid, I write it down, I share it with someone, I ask God to remove the character defects that I've found by taking inventory of that fear. I, I check and see if that fear has caused me to harm anyone and I clean it up quickly if I have. And then I ask God to help me turn my thoughts instead of inward to myself, to my own fears, my own little problems and designs, but outward. Who out there can I be helping instead of sitting around feeling paralyzed about whatever it is that's scaring me? How can I be using this time and my energy to help another human being? Maybe another alcoholic or an addict, maybe somebody else. Who knows? God will give us the right answers. The right answers will come if we really want them. So if you look at that, Right. Look at all the different steps that we saw covered in one just one little paragraph. It's almost a summary of the whole program of action. Right. We've entered the world of the spirit. That's really our step three decision. Uh, we are going to continue to watch for all of these things. That's our step four moral inventory. We're going to discuss them with someone quickly. That's our step five sharing. We are going to ask God to remove the character defects we discover. That's six and seven. And we're going to make amends quickly if we've harmed anyone. That's eight and nine. And then we're going to turn our thoughts to someone we can help because step 12, after all, is the foundation stone of our recovery. Folks, it's all there. And that's that's a pretty simple set of instructions. Simple but not easy. You know, we know a price has to be paid, a certain death to self, a certain death to self-centeredness. But this is the program of action, right? You know, step 11 is covered separately because that's like on the next page. But this is what we learned to do in steps three through nine. And what step 10 is telling us is if you want the miracle in your life of true neutrality with respect to whatever it is that's been bothering you, alcohol in my case could be anything, if you want that miracle, you can have it as long as you commit to this simple program of action on a daily basis. I like to think of the 12 steps as especially the action steps, right? Everything sort of the, uh, described from the beginning of the chapter, how it works through into action as a set of spiritual exercises that we are going to work for the rest of our lives, right? Steps one and two are a little different. Uh, they're essentially a diagnostic and coming to believe type step, but we have to renew our step three decision every day. We have to continue to watch for all these things cropping up on our life every day. And we have to do the very same things that we learned to do when we were working the steps the first time on a continual basis. Because what will happen if we don't, I think, is that we will initially experience these 10 step promises. We'll go through our moral inventory. Well, and we'll have a lot of trash to take out. We'll do all the stuff. We'll share it. We'll ask for God's help. We'll start making amends and we will experience the promises of recovery. We'll experience step 10. But as time passes and things pile up, new resentments, because we're not, you know, we're probably not going to be restored, to, uh, we're instantly catapulted into a state where we never experience anger again, not right away. As new fears happen, because new scary things happen all the time, as we hurt people anew, we, we cause fresh harms, because again, we're not perfect yet. If we don't use the process that we just learned to bag that trash up, take it out, and clean up the mess, then we are rapidly going to find ourselves in an unrecovered state. Our conscious contact with God is going to become blocked off again. We're not going to be able to receive direction from the one who has all the power. And we're not going to start experiencing those step 10 
promises anymore. And that is why sometimes I think the most useful thing um, that I have learned to ask a person who is, uh, they've been sober for a while, right? Uh, they've been recovered for a while, but it's been, it's been six months maybe, and they're starting to feel kind of bad again right? They're starting to deal with temptation again. They're starting to have those, those thoughts and they can feel like the insidious insanity of that first drink or whatever lurking around the corner. I think one of the most helpful questions we can ask that person as we try to you know, uh, keep each other on our feet is, when is the last time you took inventory? When is the last time you wrote down a resentment, a fear, or a harm to another person, shared it with someone, and did all of the actions that are indicated in step 10? Because if it's been a while, uh, you might find that there's more to inventory than you think. You might have a lot of garbage piled up, uncollected, and that is blocking you off from the sunlight of the spirit, and that is why you are not experiencing those 10-step promises. And that's a wonderful uh, question to be able to ask, because what it means is that You've got a common problem, and the answer is to be found in our common solution. So the Step 10 Promises saved my life. The Step 10 Directions, I suppose, really saved my life. Uh, and I, I think that uh, they are a wonderful, wonderful vision of what's possible uh, with this program of recovery. So with that, it's the bottom of the hour, and I've been going for a good long time. So I'll certainly be interested to hear uh, questions and reactions from all of you who are listening now. Love it. Thank you so much, Ian. Good stuff, man. I, I really appreciate your share there, the energy you had behind it and the experience that you shared with that. I love the concept of neutrality and I experienced that neutrality in my own um, recovery and what a miracle that is. A miracle. Awesome. So reminder to our live audience, if you have questions for Ian, please type them in the Q&A link at the bottom of your Zoom window. It looks like two speech bubbles over the top of each other. We'll get to those as they come in. Before we get to any of those questions, Ian, I'd like to maybe do a role play, a step 10 role play. Um, sure. If you've had a fear or a resentment or something here in the last couple of days that that jumps out at you, why don't you pretend like you're picking up the phone and giving me a call and running through that step 10 with me? Absolutely. So I can actually use, uh, I can use a real one. Right, because this was a few days ago, um, and it's not the most recent 10 step inventory I've shared with somebody, but this was one that happened a few days ago. So I was experiencing a fear of my son, who you mentioned, I have a beautiful four year old son, uh, a fear that every parent has probably experienced, which is what if he dies somehow? Now he's perfectly healthy. I'm just haunted sometimes by a fear that he will be in an accident. I asked myself, why do I have this fear? Right? How has self reliance failed me? And the reason I'm afraid of this is because there's so much in the world I can't control, car accidents, falls, rare diseases, and I'm afraid that if he were gone, I would not be able to keep going on my own power and that I would surely drink again and die. I'm afraid of all my beliefs about God and the life of the world to come wouldn't end up being true and that it would mean I would never see him again. I'm afraid of him suffering or being afraid if he's sick and not being able to help him because I can't control those things. Now, I have self-confidence in my ability to care for him, especially since I've recovered, but this self-confidence doesn't fully solve that fear problem because there's so much that I can't do, so much I can't control, right? And then I look to that um, paragraph in the chapter that gives the instructions on a fear inventory that goes like this. Perhaps there's a better way. We think so. For we're now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves, finite selves, excuse me. We are in the world to play the role he assigns just to the extent that we do as he would have, as we think he would have us and humbly rely on him. Does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? And so here's what I'm thinking about doing about this fear. I'm going to ask God to remove this fear. And instead of perseverating on something I can't control, remember that I'm in the world to play the role that he assigns. In particular, I'm going to ask him to direct my attention to the father he wants me to be today, right now, instead of squandering the time that I do have with Seamus, that's my son's name, however long that is, on trying to play the director again. I'm going to ask him to fill me up with gratitude for every moment that I do have with my son and to help me feel peace with the reality, and it is a reality, that one day, one way or another, my time with my son in this life will be at an end. Right. That's going to happen one way or another. And I'm going to ask God what he would have me do to make the most of that time to be the best father I can be for Seamus while we are both still here. And especially to ask him to increase my trust 
that whatever comes after this life is exactly as it should be. And so I would read you all that. And then I'd say, any thoughts? So I'll ask you any thoughts. Uh, first off, very common fear, I think for parents. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, any additional thoughts? I don't have any additional feedback. It sounded like you were very thorough in your going through of those fears. And uh, I really appreciate that. It actually opened my eyes to a couple of uh, angles that I had not yet looked at in similar fears like that. Thank you. Thank you. And and for everybody listening, see, it could be that simple, right? That's not That's not so hard, is it? Right. Mostly when you share inventory with someone, you're just you're reading what you've written. They listen just like Justin did. And if they have any obvious reactions that jump out at them, they might share them just like your sponsor did in, in the fifth step. Uh, but a lot of time, the reaction I get when I share st 10 steps with people is like, looks, you know, that's good. No notes. You know, that's it. And that's great. Um, and but there is still there's still a lot of magic in it because uh, it can take two to see one. And sometimes the reactions I get from people are, have you, you know, they're helpful questions, right? Have you considered this angle or, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about the situation just so we can fully explore like, you know, any mistakes you've might've made, things like that. And I think that's really great. And, um, you know, I, I, it really has improved my life. I've got a few people, uh, other uh, fellows I know in AA who um, we have sort of a group chat and it's like a 10th step hotline. And I think this is a common practice and it's a really good practice to just get together with some of your friends and share this stuff with one another. And I would note, by the way, that, you know, that there doesn't seem to be any magic in the particular medium, right? I think a phone call is a great way to share this. I've shared inventory just written. I've shared an inventory by voice memo and I've had it shared with me that way. I think the magic is in the sharing of it. And so don't let a particular medium uh, of doing so, I, you know, I have a you know one of my uh, beloved sponsees likes to use this app called Marco Polo, which is like a uh, video app uh, where you send video messages back and forth. I think that's great too. The the medium isn't the point, right? Just share this stuff however you can, and I think you will see some some magical results. Yeah, I'm also a part of a like a WhatsApp group where often it's shared through voice memo, and that's a fantastic way to do it. I mean, Absolutely. I get it out there. I speak it out loud. And I think, that, like you said, I think there's power in that, whether somebody hears me immediately or it may take 10, 10 or 15 minutes for them to to listen and, and provide any feedback if there is any or just a, you know, a thumbs up. I got gotcha. you. Um, there's power in that. Thank you for sharing that. Very good. All right. First question from our live audience. This is from an anonymous attendee. This person says, I've been having issues with my 10th step in terms of getting right, right getting right under the skin and seeing things clearly particularly with when I was selfish, self-seeking, or dishonest. Is there anywhere in the book that gives us examples of different behaviors like that? Well, the examples, um, what I would direct you to is, let's just take a look, we'll flip back to, um, you know, to how it works, right? Uh, and the instructions um, for the inventory for, you know, resentment and all that stuff, they start uh, on page uh, 64, right? And on page 65 is when we have the uh, the examples of, resentments, right? Um, and what we can see from these examples is, you know, for example, we get the uh, we get the fictitious Mr. Brown, you know, the guy who really, you know, I, I'm a little resentful of Mr. Brown. I don't like this guy. He's uh, because the imaginary writer is resentful because of he says his attention to my wife told my wife of my mistress, and he might get his job at the office, right? So what that tells me is, we don't need to write, uh, you know, a treatise, on why we're angry. We don't need to write a ton about what we're afraid of and the reasons for it. We don't need to write a ton about um, you know, how we've been uh, selfish or dishonest or inconsiderate to someone else, right? Another harm, in, another inventory I shared with somebody recently involved uh, a harm uh, that I had perpetrated uh, against uh, my my girlfriend. And the, I won't read that one, but the paragraph describing what it is that I'd done is like uh, two sentences, right? And so I think the key there is to just acknowledge the basics, because what we want to get to is where were our mistakes? That's the key. All the other things, the the you know detailing of the resentment, the parts of self it affects, or the the fear um, that you know we're having, or whatever. All these are diagnostic tools to discover where self is blocking us from a two way relationship with our maker. 
right? That's what we're really trying to get to. And so uh, I don't know if this is completely responsive to the question, but you know, if you're having trouble kind of getting under the skin or things like that, just uh, it's never a bad idea to ask God for some help and direction as you take inventory. I always like to do that. Before I sit down and do this stuff, I always like to just say a short prayer uh, to direct my thinking, right? Borrow a little bit from the 11th step. Say, as I sit down to write this inventory, direct my thinking and show me uh, the defects in myself that are blocking me from a two-way relationship with you. Right. And if that kind of prayer is sincere and you keep at it, I think you're going to be able to see results. And so uh, the main thing is, though, you'll also get better at this as you do it. Right. Uh, Practice, 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 you know, uh, a, a sort of, you know, slightly malformed or misshapen or not quite right attempts to take inventory of this stuff and be rid of it is a lot better than not doing it at all. And as you practice and and you see the results from that your conscious contact with God will increase. The clarity with which you're able to see things is going to increase. And that's going to mean your inventory gets better too. So I hope that's useful. Excellent. I appreciate that run through with that. Next question is from Nikki M. Nikki, welcome back. Ian, my sponsor brother, she says, clear cut instructions. And I want what you have. Our big bucks, our big book sponsorship family really does the work. Now here's the question. How do you stay spiritually fit and recoil from sick people when most humans are running around on self-will without a program of action? Hey, Nikki, my my sponsor's sister. Wonderful question. Um, and it's a great question, right? Because uh, what we're told in the chapter on how it works is that most people, not most alcoholics, not most addicts, most people live lives on self-propulsion. And we have to live in a world where people are going to continue to step on our toes and uh, we're going to it's going to upset us. And we're going to have to figure out a way uh, not to just regress back into the way we used to live our lives. And so um, what I like to do, the the most high octane thing that I've ever discovered for this uh, is, as you say, this is a book full of clear cut instructions. So I'm not going to say anything, uh, hopefully, that people haven't heard before. But uh, I love the the so-called sick man's prayer or maybe the sick person's prayer. Right. And this is from pages 66 and 67 from how it works. Um, When we live in a world full of uh, sick people, we should be immediately thinking of this, right? Because on page 66 and continuing over to 67, it says, we realize that the people who wronged us, in other words, there are going to be people who wrong us in this life, folks, it's going to happen, were perhaps spiritually sick. Hmm. Though we did not like their symptoms and the way these disturbed us, in other words, we don't have to pretend that when people do stuff that bothers us that we like it. Right. No, we don't have to pretend to like their symptoms or the way that they disturbed us. What we have to do is acknowledge and quoting again, they like ourselves. Very important. We're sick, too. Right. In other words, we should be able to empathize with a sick person hurting other people because we've had a lot of experience doing that. And these people are they may not be alcoholics or addicts, uh, but they like us are sick, too. And one way we can know that is whenever you're in a situation where you've got a person and their their symptoms are disturbing you, so to speak. And just ask yourself, if you need trouble being convinced, uh, would a spiritually fit person who is deeply in touch with their maker, who is in an effective two-way relationship with uh, you know, a God of love and understanding and effectiveness, would they be doing this? Probably not, right? You know, probably not. Uh, and so, you know, they just the fact that they're doing something that's that's, you know, upsetting you and hurting you uh, is probably an indication of spiritual sickness. So what do we do about that? Right. Because the big book is very big on this idea. We can't wish away things like this. We can't wish away resentments any more than we can wish away alcoholism or addiction. What we do is, quote, we asked God. In other words, we're going to need help to help us show them the same tolerance, pity and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. When a person offended, and here's here's the real answer to the question. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, quote, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. Thy will be done. Now, I place the sick man's prayer up there with some of the highest octane, most effective tools that I got access to when I was taught this spiritual program of action. It is it is like an A-bomb on uh, anger and you know misdirected self-will um, for me. Uh, because we're told to avoid retaliation or argument. Why? Well, we wouldn't treat sick people that way. And if we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. And this section concludes by saying, look, we're not going to be able to be helpful to all people, 
right? That's not probably going to happen because it's not God's, God doesn't want us to have a role in helping every single person and being involved in the life of every single human being on the planet. We're not that important. He is, but he's got this stuff. But it says, at least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. In other words, God can at least improve our attitude. He can give us the right perspective, even if we can't be helpful to, to people. So um, that's what that's what it's really all about, right? We're going to need to be able to find a way to take a kindly and tolerant attitude of each and every person in the world. Yes, even the one you are thinking of, right? Yes, even that guy, even that girl, even them. Um, and But to do that, we are not going to be able to do it on our own. We can't just decide, yeah, yeah, I'm going to be kindly and tolerant. No, we're going to have to enlist the help of the omnipotent creator of the universe, our maker. We're going to have to ask God for help because I can't think myself into spiritual fitness any more than I could have thought myself out of alcoholism. So I hope that answers your question. It's a great one and uh, love you very much, Nikki. It, it, yeah, that's awesome. And Nikki, I think Nikki is the one who opened my eyes to this. You know, in one of my primary fellowships, a very common term is, oh, I was triggered by this. I was triggered by that. And Nikki says, our whole dang life is a trigger. The yeah. life in the world is a trigger. Get over it. Absolutely. Use the sick man's prayer, basically. So yeah, my, my trigger, my trigger before I recovered, my trigger was like being alive and awake at the same time, right? A little bit tough to avoid that one, right? I need a way to live in a world full of sick people. And in fact, I need more than that. I don't want to just survive in this world. My charge is to go and ask how I can be helpful to those people, right? Because the sick man's prayer is not supposed to be like, oh, bless his heart. He just doesn't know what he's doing. He's just sick. No, it's asking God. The first thing we ask God for is how can I be helpful to this person? And the answer might be, thanks for asking. You know, there is no way, but here's the right attitude to take. And I have to say the sick man's prayer, it's so effective that sometimes, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll admit this. Time to get honest. I'll admit this. Sometimes I deliberately hold out for a few minutes before using it because I know it is going to take away my anger uh, or or whatever. I know it's effective, and I don't I don't want to let go of it yet, right? So you can still that I'm, I'm you can see I'm still spiritually growing, but um, but it's it's it is like magic for me, and so um, it's an essential part I think of taking inventory of anger is going through this process. It's really powerful because it reminds us. That, um, you know, if someone's triggering you, yeah, they just triggered you to ask God to help you be helpful to them. Right. So how do you like that? <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Sometimes I like to sit in my poopy diaper for a minute too, after exactly before making it clean it up. Exactly. All right. We got a question here from Liana. Uh, Liana says, I have been through the steps three times, but there are many times that I can't even recognize which is my resentment or my fear. I just feel self-pity or in a bad mood. What, what would you suggest in that situation? So if you're feeling self-pity, um, I think that, that you are experiencing a resentment. Um, I was working with a guy a little while back, and he's, we got to the instructions for the moral inventory, and he said, yeah, I can't, I can't really think of anybody I'm, I'm feeling resentful to. And I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you're cured, I guess. Um, but the question I asked him, which helped, I think, shake things loose a little bit was, okay, let's phrase it this way. Who do you think owes you an apology, Right. You know, forget forget your amends to other people. I know that, you know, because because typically people are in the position of like, you know, they can understand that they've done harm, but they're they're fooling themselves. And it, it may be a sincere fooling uh, into thinking, well, I don't I don't feel any resentment. And ask yourself, OK, if you're feeling self-pity, right, or in a bad mood, ask yourself, is there anybody who has contributed to that bad mood? Right. Is there anybody who owes you an apology? And look, blamo, you've just identified a resentment. That's the same thing. Right. And so uh, when it comes to that, I think that that can be a helpful question. I would also suggest as a global matter, um, if you're having trouble identifying these things, remember, it doesn't take an exhaustive list of like hundreds of things to get down to the root causes and conditions, the the character defects that are stopping us from that two way relationship. So um if you can't think of anything more than maybe three or four or five big resentments, I think that's enough to make a beginning, right? Because not all resentments are created equal. Most of the time, we've got off the top of our head, usually a really intimate relationship in our life, right? Maybe a spouse, uh, maybe a parent, maybe a, an employer, but somebody that is a big, big part of our life, a close friend that we feel very upset with. 
there is a ton of juice on working through that resentment, taking inventory of it, doing all the steps on that resentment. And it'll get you usually to a lot of the uh, root causes and conditions, um, even if there are going to be some things that, uh, you know, somebody pulled your hair in third grade and you kind of forgot about them or things like that. Um, similarly with fears, um, I can appreciate that uh, I didn't think I actually was a, as a fearful of the person as I discovered I was uh, after recovery. I knew that I was a resentful, angry guy when I was getting sober. I knew that. And I knew I'd hurt a lot of other people. When it came to fears, I thought I sort of, sort of thought of myself as this kind of brave swashbuckling, you know, blah, blah, blah. But that was all complete nonsense. What I discovered is that um, I actually had a lot of fears that I wasn't aware of until I actually recovered. And I continued to take inventory in step 10. I realized I'd be sitting around and be like, oh, my God, I'm terrified of economic insecurity. And I've been feeling this way for God knows how long. And I'm just realizing I'm afraid. I'm deeply afraid. And I've had to take inventory of and sometimes I've had to take inventory of the same fear more than once. Right. Because it may not be, you know, due to the nature of my willingness and the nature of my spiritual growth. I may need to take inventory and share it um, and ask God to remove the defect. I mean, you do it more than once. Right. Before I can commence to completely outgrow it. And so that's OK. So um, that's what I'd say. Uh, if you feel self-pity, then ask yourself, um, what are you pitying yourself for? Who has treated you badly? Uh, and if you feel in a bad mood, uh, then ask yourself why. Because you, if you think, well, things are never going to get better, or I'm just, you know, I'm just in this bad situation, it'll never improve. Well, that is a fear, right? So, in other words, don't worry too much about the labels you're attaching to these things. We're trying to get to manifestations of self, and try describing maybe to an understanding fellow the things that you feel self pitying about or that are driving your bad mood. And maybe they can help you sort of slot those in to, you know, appropriately. But as long as, you know, take inventory of this stuff and ask yourself the root defects of character anyway. And even if they don't fit neatly into like the resentment, fear, harms to others box, well, just let's just try and see if we can get some insight into what's blocking us from God anyway. So don't let that stop you. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, definitely. We've got lots of questions that have come in. We're only going to have time for maybe two, maybe three more, but we're going to get to as many as we can. This one's from Gregory. He says, I sometimes see a relation between resentments and fears and have and have to do a resentment inventory to discover that there is also a fear underlying that resentment. Have you seen this? And have you seen relationship between resentments, fear and guilt from Hertz? Sure. Oh, absolutely. Uh, thanks for that question, Gregory. Yeah. If you look at page 65, uh, when it gives the example inventory of resentments, uh, you know, Mr. Brown, who we were talking about earlier, uh, the you know book says that one of the things it affects is self-esteem and causes uh, fear, right? Uh, and so absolutely, these are interrelated because what the book tells us is that all of these things are common manifestations of self, right? They are all just self getting in the way of a two-way relationship with the one who has all the power. And so it's very common. Very common. It was certainly true for me to have the same situation show up both uh, in a, as a resentment, as a fear, and as an instance of me doing harm to other people, right? Because the same situation can make me feel angry, afraid, and can uh, and can result in me doing harm to other people. So I think that's that's very common. And if so, that means you're probably if you've got one of those triple winners, that's probably going to be a real high octane one that's really good to take inventory of and use all of the spiritual tools on it because you have got a major blockage and you should be pleased to discover those because it's like wow this is a big piece of garbage when i get this out of here uh you know there's gonna be a lot it's gonna be a lot sunnier inside my spirit amen amen all right uh we'll do one more question here let's go and do amanda's amanda says thanks thanks ian great info when you finish steps one through nine with your sponsees, what is your practice for the last three steps? Do you walk them through step 10 and pause, or do you get them straight to the maintenance or growth steps as we talked about here by sharing steps 10 through 12 and sending them off to sponsor? Well, I think it depends a little bit on the person, but my general practice is um, have them get going on the ninth step amends. Um, and they should do that immediately after getting the instructions. They should get going immediately. And as long as they've gotten going immediately, then I don't wait to give them 10, 11, and 12 um, because we're supposed to commence those as we clean up the past anyway. Now, uh, my sponsor gave me the instructions for 10, 11, and 12 uh, all in one sitting. 
right? Uh, we covered all of that and a little section of, uh, of a vision for you. And he said, all right, I'm going to cut you loose in the fellowship because business is booming and we need you on the front lines uh, and you're not going to F them up any worse than they already are. Um, and I've, and sometimes I think that's, that's appropriate. I've done that with people. Um, other times, if just due to scheduling stuff or whatever, uh, we can only meet and talk about, you know, 10 and 11 together. And we have a separate conversation about 12, or maybe we're talking, I'm talking with a person who feels a little nervous about sponsorship. And so it's worthwhile to have a separate conversation about how, you know, to really drive home that helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery, right? Sponsorship is not you know, extra credit, right? This, this is the thing, the whole thing is built on. So I think it depends on the person. You know, I think you got to sponsor the person in front of you, but the main thing is just do, just get through it uh, quickly, right? That's, that's the thing is that I don't think it's a good idea to leave weeks between 10, 11 and 12, because then you've got a person who they've taken inventory, they've shared it, but they're not out there helping others. Weeks are passing. And, and folks, if you're like me, if weeks pass without access to the maximum strength, spiritual power that step 12 and 10, 11 and 12 together really form a stool of the maximum strength, spiritual power. I, I don't think I could go weeks without access to that. And so what's going to happen to that person if you wait too long, you know, if you just send them off to do some amends for a few weeks and then come back to you, you know, I just I worry that what will happen is the insidious insanity will return. They will drink again, and then, God forbid, they're going to start to think, hey, this program doesn't work, when in reality, it does work. It just needs to be administered uh, with you know, all the speed the patient requires. So um, you know, I think you can, do, you can do both, and the main thing is, um, with all that stuff, I'm always trying to grow in my approach by asking God to direct me how to most effectively carry the message to each person that I'm working with. Right. And to, and to remember that this is not about my ideal of how people should be sponsored. Uh, it's not even about copying the incredibly good model um, that my sponsor used with me. Uh, it is always, always about and he'd be the first person to agree with this. It is always about asking God, what is your will for me in this situation with this person? How can I be most helpful to this person? Does that mean 10, 11 and 12 all in one day? Does that mean 10, 11 and 12 on three consecutive days? What does it mean, God? Tell me and being very, very willing to listen and hear that answer. So hope that's useful. Uh, love it, Ian. And to everybody who we didn't get to um, your questions I'm going to post all the questions that were asked in this on our Facebook page and also on our WhatsApp group. I put the links to that and how you can join those if you aren't already in those. So you can answer those, ask those, come back to it. Um, also, uh, come back next week, guys. Uh, this was a great RICO 12 weekly speaker meeting. And uh, next week, it'll be another great one. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Priya P., and her topic is going to be facing fear with faith, which, which I think is a good follow-up to what we just talked about here. We talked a lot about fears and facing them with faith. I think it'll be really good. Yeah. Um, now, uh, if you have not yet rated or reviewed uh, Rico 12 in Apple Podcasts, please go do so now. It's a great way to help us get the word out to more people. The more ratings and reviews, the more visible the podcast is out there in the podcast world. Um, also, once again, starting March 1st, Rico 12 shares is, is launching. If you want to, if, if you felt something in this and you went, holy cow, that is an aha idea. Go and record something at Rico 12 shares, uh, www.rico12.com forward slash shares, record your share there, get it out there, speak it because there's power to speaking it. So it sticks deeper in your, in your mind and, th and thoughts. All right, let's launch off into the rest of our day with a prayer from, uh, St. Thomas Merton. Are you willing to say that Ian? Yeah, let me just pull it up here. Okay. This is a great prayer uh, that was shared with me by a recovered fellow. This is from St. Thomas Merton. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I'm following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, will I trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. 
Amen. Everybody, there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find God now. Keep coming back, everybody. Let's trudge this happy road of destiny together. Jesus.